I'd like to thank you for uh, coming out to work camp this year. It's been an extraordinary effort on uh, the part of all of our organizers. And also thank you for joining me today to talk about managing project expectations. Uh, and we'll jump right into things. So, who am I? Um, my name is David Yard. I'm the co-founder of Sevenality, which is a branding and design firm. We focus specifically on uh, targeting issues that relate to user experience um, and using design thinking to kind of cover those different touch points. I'm um, <coughs> an organizer of the User Experience Orlando Meetup group here in Orlando and one of the co-organizers here for WordPress Orlando. I've uh, been in this for about the past 10 years, uh, I think from WordPress to dealing with remote teams around the world in areas like Qatar and uh, where else? India, Peru, so on and so forth. Um, so lots that I've learned and lots that I would like to share to hopefully make your projects a little bit less stressful as time goes on. So the importance that I like to start out with or the things that I feel is very, very important is the discovery phase. Um, few people really take the time to sit down and go through a proper discovery phase. Um, things are just kind of, or a discovery phase may include things like, okay, here's what do you want, um, here's what I can do for you, here's how much it's going to cost, do you have any logos, any graphics that you'd like to use, and jump right into things. Um, then as you go throughout a project, you'll find that, oh, you didn't get particular assets that you need, like say you needed fonts delivered from a client, or you needed, uh, you know, something in terms of content, whatever it is, or you discovered a problem um, that could have been found in this discovery phase. Uh, so why do you need one? Um, it validates what you really need in your project. Um, many of us, of course, are starting our projects out on WordPress, but what plugins do we need? Um, are we delivering fonts in from like a third party? Do they already have a brand guidelines that we can use? Um, if they don't, do we need to create one for the sake of this project? Um, it also allows you to prototype very quickly. Uh, in many cases when um, in the past I've had to do projects for a much larger scale company, they really need to see what it was that I was going to be building um, and I guess get a better idea of how I was going to do my estimates for that particular project. Uh, and so in doing that I was able to, with having a proper discovery phase, figure out some of the things that they needed um, and quickly prototype uh, a proof of concept um, to be able to get moving into the next one, more accurate cost estimates. Is it really going to take me nine hours to build out this particular feature? Or is it going to take 11? Or am I lucky enough for it to only take one or two? Um, and that, by knowing what you have, being able to prototype it in some way, whether it's on paper, on your iPad, on your computer, there are a variety of different tools for this, um, you're able to get a lot better in terms of your cost estimates, which allow you to be able to actually make a profit on the project that you're doing. Uh, validating the business case, which is a little bit different from validating what you need. Um, in many cases, when it comes down to validating the business case, you want to know why is it that we're building out these set of features? Is it just to be better than the business Joneses next door? Or are we actually taking into account what this business needs to grow over the course of the next three months, six months, a year, and so on? Um, and it also gives you a really, really great chance to explore different ideas in coming to the end of that solution. Um, Many times we would get a project intake in, we'll do our discovery phase, and we have a list of assumptions that we want to cover in the beginning. Um, and in going through and finding all the different nuances, finding what the business case is, uh, we're able to kind of pair different ideas together and even present them um, as ways that the business can grow using whether it's design or development. Um, something different, kind of like a miniature research and development session as you go along. Uh, in many cases, the focus on getting the job done is always the most important thing. Uh, but without knowing what value you're bringing um, and who you'll be working with and properly being able to communicate with them, uh, jumping into a project really is kind of wasting everyone's time at that point. Um, focus a lot more on you know, defining what it is that you are bringing to the table in terms of your project, in terms of your skill set to that particular project. And also in this, 
define or you know be comfortable with yourself in knowing that you don't have to know everything. Uh, even though I've been doing this for the past 10 years and started out as a designer and worked into programming, project management, uh, remote team leads, all those kind of things, there are times when I still have to pick up the phone and say, hey, David, I don't know how to do X, Y, Z. Have you experienced this before? Um, and a lot of that allows me, or I'm able to do this because I've been able to define what it is that I'm aiming to do in the project, uh, what is the business needs for it, um, and in any of the ideas that I've seen in getting to this solution, where are the gaps in my knowledge that I can reach out to someone else and get this done? Um, some people will actually believe that, hey, a discovery session is not necessary. It's holding us back from getting this project launched. Um, and hey, it's just a nice way to charge clients for extra you know, stuff throughout that thing. Um, but without a solid know-how of you know, what it is that you're aiming to do, or taking in all the things that could potentially go wrong in terms of your project, uh, what will happen in the end? Disaster, mayhem, stress, and high levels of anxiety. Um, so it's very, very important to analyze, document, basically through every step of your process, what is happening. Reviewing this documentation as you go along and having that clear idea of what's going on um, allows you to spot when things are veering off course in terms of scope creep or scope changes, which is a very, very common problem. Um, and it also gives you the uh, bigger picture or more detailed picture of being able to say, this is A, B, C, and D that I need to get uh, my project going. Because if you can't define what your project is, if you can't define what even your process is during that project, then chances are you're not fully sure of what it is you want to accomplish. Um, and you're just kind of throwing it together, getting everything going. Um, William Edwards Denning, or Deming, rather, he was an American engineer. Um, he did a lot of stuff with statistics. Um, he also did some authoring of things as well, lecturing, all these different things. But his biggest thing that actually impacted the way in which our day-to-day -day lives go nowadays and why he's important to what we're talking about today is the sampling techniques that he came up with are actually still being used by the U.S. Department of Census today. Um, when he did them years and years and years ago, he didn't know that they would probably be used to the scale at which they are now. Um, but he was able to identify what his issue was, what it was going to be used for, and in terms of business case, something to track government growth and different demographics across the board. Um, so he was able to understand his process and in that be able to come up with something that is actually scalable and useful um, as time goes on and affects all of our lives. So, oops, didn't realize that you were taking a picture there. So, a successful discovery phase, what does that look like? What does it include? Um, it will vary different on whatever project you're working on, whether it's a very small project or a very large one. Um, in many of the projects that we'll go through, especially from a branding point of view, we highlight very, very importantly, what is your business mission, vision, or project goals? Um, primarily the vision and the mission. It allows us to kind of set up what is, or I like to call the true north of where this product or design or service is supposed to be going. Um, it allows me to really take into account what are the functional requirements that I'm going to be writing for my designers, for my developers, um, or for the user experience architects or information architects to be able to work with throughout their process. And what will they be building their functional requirements off of as well? Um, and then, of course, informa information architecture. Uh, what is this menu supposed to solve? Is it just supposed to have a bunch of things that are leading to random pages around the site? Or is it focused something on telling a specific story and having a very intentional action from the user as they're browsing? And these are things that, of course, are really great to go into a uh, discovery phase. Um, 
user experience research findings. Um, these can go anywhere from the places people use, the devices that you're aiming, whether it's an app or if it's a website, where are they using them most common? Are they using them more often in the morning or afternoon? Is it uh, something they're using in between stops on their commute? Um, are they older in age? Different things like those go into your findings. They go into being able to say, okay, design team, I need a site that is going to cater to 25 to 45 year old uh, women and they primarily use their devices during the morning uh, on their way to work in between you know stops at the light whatever the case is this now will be different from say an app that is targeted at people 18 to 35 and maybe all male different use case different set of functional requirements different storytelling techniques that are going to be going into this um, another thing that we like to do in our discovery phase is once we've been able to kind of get an idea of how long it's going to take us to build something, uh, we then give the client a schedule. This is what to expect. This is what we're going to expect from you. Um, and it gives time in between each and every step so that no department or no team is necessarily rushed. Um, our goal is to get the best quality of work from people without making them feel anxious or, or um, stressed out in getting that to you. Um, stressful and anxiety, and anxi anxious situations, sorry, uh, tend to make people overlook certain details in their deliverables, um, overlook certain techniques that they would more commonly use in a way more relaxed environment. Um, and these are some of the things that we kind of tried to accomplish with our project scheduling. Uh, when it comes to, of course, project cost estimate, as we covered before, this gives you a little bit better idea of how each step is going to cost in terms of your overall thing, allows you to better plan, okay, this is how much, you know, revenue I'm aiming to make, how much profit I'm going to be making off of it, things like that, that you'll be able to account for here. Also, in your project costs, leave room for doomsday scenarios, as I like to say them. Um, developer gets sick. Designer has, you know, a problem. They're not able to complete things on time. Uh, these are very common things, especially when you're first starting out. Um, as you have more substantial teams and you're growing, these are things that still remain in some way or another. We're all human beings. Um, and then, of course, a non-functional prototype. Uh, which is a little bit different from your proof of concept prototype. Uh, this would include things like your wireframes or very simple click-throughs, um, if you have those to kind of give the client an idea of what's going to be happening in the project or how they're going to be interacting with the different deliverables that you're giving to them as well. So getting into the good part after you've done a very solid discovery phase, how to identify problems. Um, what would you think is actually the most common area with project management? That's a good one. I like that one. But surprisingly, it's not. So Harvard did a study on this because Harvard, I love their studies and they're cool with that. And they did about the big 1400, a little bit around there, and found that most projects tend to get overrun by 27%. One in six of those projects had a cost that went over the amount estimated by about 200% and went over schedule by about 70%. So what does this tell us? Is there's, there's a problem somewhere. It's coming from something, whether it's our discovery phase, tons of things happening. So if you really break down the number of what this percentage really is, let's say 245 of those 1,471 projects experience that catastrophic delay, which means companies aren't making money, staff is very stressed out, productivity is completely tanking, and nothing is going to keep getting better. So one great way to kind of go through and deal with this is have an escalation strategy. Um, how are your teammates reporting problems that are going on? How are they you know, taking responsibility for each aspect of the project that's going on? What is their, what's their lead in that project? If something happens that they're not readily able to solve, who is going to make the call if, let's say, the top person isn't around on that project? Who's next to handle what's going to happen? 
Um, things often escalate long before we really realize them in that major blowout. It may be a little thing where uh, designs were overlooked, a change wasn't made, and now QA is going in and this doesn't look like the things that were designed. Um, what's happening? Where was this documented? Um, who is supposed to you know, report to them? What's next? So an escalation strategy allows you to really account for the worst case scenario. Uh, if a designer is out, do I have another designer that I know that can fill in and pick up where that person left off? Am I short in terms of skill sets with front-end development? Do I need to have someone that can help my front-end developer take it to the next level? Do I have adequate support in back-end for the project that I'm looking in? Um, am I trying to have a front-end developer do a back-end developer's job? Um, and if they're able to do that job, at what point does that knowledge gap you know, start to begin? This all goes into your escalation strategy. It allows you to really say, okay, if this happens, I can do this. It leaves you less frazzled, less in a state of panic, and clearer thinking in being able to get from point A to point B and deliver an exceptional product. Toyota has a method of doing this in their day-to-day -day thing that they've kind of called Kaizen, which actually means the whole thing about change and transformation. Um, but for them, if you're on the assembly line and there's a part that's having poor quality, someone can pull down you know, a little string or a level and say, hey, we have a problem here. And they're able to kind of go in and look and say, well, did this affect the previous batch? Is it something that is just localized to this one area? Or is it something that happens in you know, the upcoming batches as well? This allows them, of course, to avoid things like recalls um, and customer complaints. And they tend to have a higher level of customer satisfaction and returning customer across generations. Um, because they put the focus on quality a lot more than on, OK, we need to turn out a million cars by the end of this year. You guys go. Um, and that's one way of kind of doing that. So common project management pitfalls, things that I've seen that could be easily avoided, um, not assigning the right person to the right task. You're having someone, of course, that's a front-end developer trying to do a back-end developer job. Or because information architecture, someone there says, oh, I can design the entire site for you. Um, they may not be up to date on the best practices for designing something out with that particular user experience. Um, so know who you are putting in the right places on your bus, otherwise you'll have a very long bus ride through a tormenting hell. <laughs> Failing to get everyone on the team behind the project. You have your kickoff meeting, and I'm sure many of you have experienced where everyone's excited, it's going great, it's amazing, but then there's that one person or two people that are just kind of like, mm, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, I'm not really in support of how this project's going to work out. Um, our last project didn't go so well, so why do we think this one's going to be any different than that? Um, understand what are some of their objections to maybe to starting this new project. If they're new to your team, find out what are some of the things that they commonly experienced that went wrong on their previous projects. Um, and kind of be a little bit more transparent in how you're handling it. Going back to your escalation strategy, if something happens and it goes wrong, it may, you know, that person may not be in support of your project now because they experienced a situation where things escalated and no one really had a proper plan in handling that. So they're now hesitant in getting behind this project. So be sure to get everyone on your team together in support and aiming in the right direction. It's much easier for a company or a team to fend off external attacks if internally they're together and strong. Um, if you're having internal issues, then you're not going to be well put together to handle anything externally, and you'll just eventually fall apart. Not getting executive buy-in. This has been the biggest thing outside of scope creep that has ruined many, many projects and limited the effectiveness in which they could have been in terms of overall success. Understand what shareholders are looking for. Uh, besides money, they may be looking for better brand awareness, uh, bigger market share that could be also you know, gained without having to go into necessarily making a whole lot of money. Um, 
understand what they're looking for, get their buy-in very, very early, it will save you a whole lot of pain. Remember our bus that was tormenting through hell? That's one way to not be on it. Um, say, for instance, you're going in, you've done your you know, discovery phase, you have everything documented, all the teams are ready to go, uh, but you've done your wireframes and you've submitted them over, you haven't really heard anything back, and you're like, well, you know what, we're going to be proactive and get on this. And you submit those wireframes maybe to design or development to start building out something until you get that you know, feedback in. What happens? Development says, oh, well, is this the final version? Design says, um, this doesn't seem to have you know, every state that we need for the proper experience. Uh, information architecture is like, oh, we haven't even done, you know, the menu or thing. So it causes you to essentially skip steps in trying to be excited to get that project rolling. So get everyone behind your project, get the executive buy-in very early. Um, it will save you a lot of time down the road. Functional requirements or not being specific enough with what the scope is. If you outline to a client to a shareholder, to a group of board of directors that the product that they're going to be receiving is going to be an application that helps them connect with local people that are looking for their product or service. But in the end, they get an app that can basically send a robot to Mars. Yeah, it's cool. You built an app that could send a robot to Mars. But did you give them what they were looking for? Did you set that expectation to say, this is what we've you know, pulled in from our research? Do you agree with this? Again, going back to our executive buy-in. And then laying that down in the scope. This is what our team will be working on. This is what designers will be responsible for. This is what developers are responsible for. Um, and then avoiding the scope to constantly change. In agile development or software teams, uh, one very big thing that is not often practiced is if you get a change request in, in that particular sprint that you're in, it should be placed outside of that. Everything in your current set of tracks should be done, and then you go in. Because, of course, this is changing the approach that you're going with. This is changing things that may you know, ultimately be designed. And in the end, it may be something that is more of a nice-to-have than a need to have. Um, providing aggressive slash overly optimistic timelines. That one is pretty self-explanatory. But if you're working with a team of people and when you originally brought that team in you said, hey, you're not going to have to work weekends or till four in the morning every night for you know the next six months because we believe that you are a person. But when it comes down time to you know, get things out the door, project schedules are a mess, you know, promise that I'll get you this done by next week, but client hasn't even responded with any of the details for you to go forward. Um, and when they do, then you're saying, oh yeah, our original timeline still holds true. Remember earlier, anxiety, high levels of stress, low quality, that is one way we can avoid that. Not having a system in place for approving and tracking these changes. We'll get them in via Skype, text message, on the back of a napkin. Um, only thing that I probably haven't gotten a change request in is smoke signals. But you name it, it has been there. Um, it could be even a picture of, oh, I saw this on you know, somewhere else, and I think this is what we should do with our thing. Yes, no. Um, how is this going to be approved into our process? Who's approving these changes? And when things go south, how does that work? Of course, our escalation strategy from before. So tracking these changes don't only help you, they help your QA team, they help your designers and your developers, and ultimately they help your client see what was originally asked for and what may have changed over the course of time when you're talking about things like scope creep. Um, it's a great amount of documentation to have and it has been a lifesaver time and time again for me. The most important part is not having a metric that defines the success of that project. Just because the project is done doesn't mean that it's successful. It could have been a complete failure, but you're able to actually get it done and out the door, 
well, the client doesn't want to work with you again. Your designers, they have a little less faith in you. Your overall team may have you know, a lot less trust in you. What are the metrics you're using to define the success of that project? Um, with these, in the projects that have actually gone 100% well over the course of time, um, it has been absolutely amazing. Team members know, you know where they ranked, where they came in originally. This may have been my skill set before this project. I grew, you know, learned a couple additional languages. A designer may have a new technique for something. They are now feeling as if they're a part of the, the entire process. They're happy. And they, of course, the next time you want to go around, you don't have to worry about trying to get their buy-in on a project. They're already there. They're already suggesting things for you to do the next time around. So the common problem that we have is a very simple-minded type focus. We strictly want to just get the project done, put money in the bank, get our name out there as having a really successful firm or agency, and move on to the next one. Um, but here's what happens. We start creating rules that go into these things. This is how you need to act on a project. You have to have A, B, C, D, E, F, G before I can even start. Um, you're now looking at people who want to comply more with the rules that you're given versus actually being someone that produces and gives results. Um, and that's not good. It'll ruin the outcome of whatever project you're on. Even if you're working on a project by yourself, if you do not focus on actually thinking outside of that bubble, realizing that you are human and you have limitations, um, and just focusing strictly on the procedures, the process, there's going to be ruin. <coughs> the humanity that drives each project, uh, whether it's a success or failure, is something that with this mindset is very often lost. Um, and this came from the uh, Gallup Business Journal back in 2012. If anyone is looking to research that and view the article a little bit more. So with these things in mind, how do we set the project scope? What needs to really happen to it? Number one, like I mentioned before, we need to have commitment. Um, commitment from leadership, most importantly, that we will help you if things happen. We're not going to throw you underneath the bus. As leaders, we are, it's our duty, really and truly, to make sure that the people that we are leading reach their full potential. If all we're doing is handing out orders, then all they're going to be really good at is following orders. But if you believe that they, when they do commit to something, that the promises that are there, that everything that happens, that these plans, that you know, this is what we're going to work with, and of course allowing room for change, then they're going to be a lot, lot more in tune with that process and getting a scope nailed down. Getting your executive buy-in very early also allows you to come to a very common place in terms of setting your scope as well. So from a very high level, there are two key components that go into setting up a project scope. Your deliverables and your boundaries. These are the things that you should expect from us. And these are the things that we are not going to do, whether it's morality or in the best interest of the user. If there's nothing else you take away from this talk today, let this be the one thing. List your deliverables. If you're doing a simple consultation project, then chances are your deliverables are going to be a list out of the different requirements that everyone agreed on, maybe a simple set of wireframes. If you're doing a web project and it has multiple components, like you're doing the brand identity design, you're integrating that into software development and you're doing this whole huge platform, <coughs> list everything. Break them down into categories and then now you're able to see, okay, this is the 100% view, this is how much has been done, this is how much is left to go, this is where I'm short in terms of resources or human ability to help me get it done, and this is what I need to get over that roadblock. Learn to say no. Yes, I like the angry baby. No is actually one of the first things we tend to learn in life. 
Uh, and we hear a lot about it as time goes on. No, mine. No, no, no. But in terms of development, no doesn't always mean that it's the end of you know, your relationship with that client. If anything, it helps you establish trust and respect with them. That they know that there is a certain level to which you are going to draw that line and stand for something. Otherwise, you'll literally fall for anything that happens and comes out of that pipeline. So to do this, to help you set a proper no, create a boundary statement, right? Help separate the things that are actually applicable to your project and things that are just, yeah, they're nice to have and you know, I wanna have them there to make things awesome, but they aren't really a part of the original scope. They may be like, oh, I want my logo to do a 3D animation that jumps in and rides on a unicorn. Honestly, I don't see how that helps you know, any business case. So, of course, this would exercise a no. Or a client says, hey, we want to support IE8, IE7, and if you're very unfortunate, IE6 and Opera Mini. Well, how much of this is you know, being used by the people using your app or whatever? If it's less than 1%, why am I dedicating huge amounts of resources to being able to do that? This would be more of a no. Or, not at this present moment, we're going to develop it out for you know, the data that we see, um, or your popular browsers, make sure that they're working in that area. And then, if we do have time at the end of it, instead of blowing through the budget and then hoping the client pays for it, we'll go and do those things as well. Um, going into your boundary statement after that, it kind of helps you when you're creating your, uh, your contracts. This is something that you'll kind of, you know, just drop in and say, these are the standard lists of browsers that we support. Um, these are the things that you'll tend to have. And they'll know, okay, these are the boundaries that I'm going to be pushing on. For me personally, with our agency, we will not work with, you know, companies that deal with tobacco or alcohol or anything in adult entertainment. That's just me. I don't want to, if I know that my skill set in something is extremely well, I want that to be going to something that is going to actually have a good benefit on society versus excelling and patting the pockets of someone that <coughs> is just there for the money. Um, so in your scope statement or your boundary statement that you're creating, what is the justification for this feature? Is it something like our unicorn example that we just really want to have because it's awesome and it's cool? Or is it something that is going to actually help the person we're building this product for achieve a lower amount of, I guess, fear in using it? It's easier for them to adopt. What is the description of this product? What, in ideally, when it's built, do I want it to look like? Um, what are the things that, I, in terms of acceptance criteria, am I going to use to say this step has everything that I need for the most part to move on to the next step? If I'm handing things off from design to development, does development have things like the fonts used, whether it's the font files or they are directed to find it from a place like Typekit? Um, do they have the logo? Do they have it in SVG format, PNG or JPEG, depending on you know, your departmental preferences? Um, little things like those before you move a project on to the next level uh, are things that you want to have in your acceptance criteria. That way, if you're going through a project and you say, well, looking at the scale of this project, I don't have the most basic hover states to move on, then I know that, okay, I need to let design know these hover states are crucial for when development is starting to you know, build out the framework that this is something they'll do in that process versus having to go back after they've done three or four or five other pages and then make sure that it's consistent through all the way out. Again, saving time, by preparing in the beginning. Project exclusions. What am I not going to do in this project? Again, I'm not going to support IE8, 7, or 6 if you know less than a certain percentage of your overall base is really using it. 
And to take that statement a little bit further, if that base, for instance, say 5% of the people are bringing in 80% of the revenue, now it changes a little bit different for me. I want to support that. But if I cannot make that correlation and say, okay, IE8 users are spending more than people who keep their browsers up to date, then it's mainly a nice to have because I just see this data keep popping up. What are the constraints that I have? Do I have enough in terms of human resources? Do I have enough in terms of uh, server space? Tangible, intangible. Do I have enough of these? What are the things that are tying my hands behind my back? Um, and then the assumptions. What do I not have? What am I making you know, my bridge mentally connecting to? If I don't have hover states, and this is a pretty simple example, I can say, well, you know, these links should have underlines underneath them. Um, and side note, for accessibility reasons, they should. Um, however, am I, is that a correct assumption? Maybe design had it that, you know, there's going to be a little arrow that pops out at the end of it and, you know, does a little animation when I hover over it. Um, that's an assumption that if I can kind of bring the question up in the beginning, I can get it answered before I actually start building or doing something else in that project. Um, so when you're creating a boundary statement or a scope statement, these are some of the things to really look for and keep in mind when you're putting that together. So earlier we mentioned that scope creep has been, you know, something that's a detrimental part. Surprisingly, that is not the biggest area where these changes come from. They actually come from your business requirements. Business is going into a new market. They, for some reason, may need a ton of print collateral. Well, that market has shifted. They no longer need as much print collateral as they once did. They may need a lot more emphasis on a digital strategy. The entire scope changes. A lot of people are upset. Printer is like, oh, I'm not going to make a whole lot of money off of this. But that's what happens in a project. Things change. We have to adapt to them. Um, and we have to keep in mind that scope changes aren't always the death of us or bad or the client doesn't know what they want. They came to us for a reason because we are the ones that have the skill to be able to take it to the level in the area that they do not have that skill in. So it's up to us to recommend what is best to keep up to date with things and to make sure that when we do get a change in, that we're understanding that it's not just a change request, that there may be a change to the business needs and that we have to address that in our uh, overall project. So our project is gone pretty well. Everything's pretty happy so far. What happens next? We have to review them. After every project, I try to make it a very big habit of doing a post-mortem or a deep dive or a retrospective. Different names mean the same thing. Review what you've done in the past. Were your assumptions correct in the beginning? How close were you to those you know, assumptions in the end when that project was over? Did you connect with everyone well? Were the, what pitfalls did you have? What are some things that could have been avoided? Document these things. And then take, you know, maybe six months after you've done a bunch of different projects, look at how you've progressed through each and every one of these. Um, a lot of our deep dives that we look back and say what has gone wrong has actually gone into content for many other things, whether it's a blog post, social media update, different things that we've learned that we'd like to share. Otherwise, if we didn't do a review, we would never have had access to this data about ourselves. We're collecting data on our clients. Why not collect data on ourselves and see how we're growing as well? Identify the project process. It differs from time to time. It could be where you need to do wireframes in this project, but all you really need to do in the next one is write out a list of requirements and hand that off to a developer. Each case needs to be understood. The deliverables need to be clear. And any achievements and lessons learned need to be documented in the end. It allows your team to know, of course, going back to defining our metrics of success, how successful was this project? How much were we close to really being successful? Or how far were we from being successful in this project? That's what happens when you do a deep dive. 
and we're going to go into how to do one. Um, so elements of a good post project implementation or as I'm going to refer to it from now a per. Um, so identifying of course the items that were done well identifying the items that could be improved. It could be, hey, handing things off to development, handing things out to the client. This is where our project is really lacking. This is where we can really up our game on the overall experience. Um, see what's broken. You may have a process that's going for years and years and you feel like it's working well, but after you've looked at some of the data that came back, it could be hindering you from being a lot more effective and efficient at your job. And then from there, decide on action plans. Have them ready. Don't just say, hey, this is was a great review. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, actually plan and saying, I'm going to implement this within the next three months, next six months, however long. Decide on a plan and work towards it. So how to prepare for a post-project implementation review? Find well, the individuals are there for many that are very small. If you're dealing with remote teams, of course, you want to send them out, maybe a link to wherever you're hosting it. But create a questionnaire or a survey that they can do on their own time. And then organize a meeting to go over the findings of this results. These two steps accomplish one very important thing. Once you send out that survey or questionnaire, you're getting a lot more uh, undisturbed reflection or feedback about your process. If you're doing that in a group setting, it tends to be kind of muddied by what the other person thinks or who is the most influential in getting their thoughts across. Um, getting that individual feedback allows you to then see, you know, whatever patterns are emerging. Are, is everyone complaining about the same thing or is it just a small subset? Kind of allows you to see what's going on in your process as well. Once all of that is done, you have a meeting, you're talking about it, limit the meeting to no more than 30 minutes. Um, spending an hour yelling back and forth, throwing each other underneath the bus does not promote a good team. Your job in this project implementation is to review it simply and keep going. Right. Then summarize that feedback in a document and store it somewhere for everybody to kind of view that as well. And quickly going through some of this, what is kind of like it's your ending area for it or some of the areas that you want to include in that? Your project stages, your processes within those different stages, the project roles, who was in charge of the different area, um, what are some of the key skills that you may have had or may be lacking, um, and what kind of products did you use throughout that process or what was the end result of that supposed to be? The best time to do this is as soon as the project ends, when the feelings and thoughts and everything are 100% fresh. Um, and then allow that to take you into setting the stage for your next project. Um, leadership, as mentioned, is an opportunity to make a difference in someone's life no matter what that project or product is. You can be a mentor to somebody. You can to help someone find their confidence in that process. As a leader, this is our job. And it allows us to use things like our company mission, vision, and values, if we spent a good portion of time building out a brand on this, to help us reduce our workload. We can now refer to the things that really drive us as a company or as a team together and work on those things from that entire um, aspect. And it helps you to let people see what the big picture of that project is. Um, so help your project participants see what's going on. The business portion, which isn't often uh, highlighted to designers and developers, should be something that should be definitely given a lot more attention to. Their job is more than just to create pretty pixels. It's actually to do something that can make a difference in the life of someone else. So here are some key takeaways for today. Have a clear project scope with sign-offs and set priorities for different features. Be realistic about everything, including people's time and the fact that they're human. 
Make sure everyone, including senior management, understands what their role is on that project. Make sure that your team members are communicating. Tools like Slack are amazing in being able to communicate across you know, various different teams. Set up calendar reminders for your milestones. They sneak up on us, especially once you're down into a zone and you have achieved like a flow state. We can forget what day it is. Sometimes I'll forget an entire set of dates throughout a week. It happens. And don't be afraid to communicate bad news. I would much rather get from someone working on my team that, hey, I can't finish this at a particular time because of X, Y, Z, versus not hearing from them at all and that time blows by. Um, or telling the client, hey, you know, we were building this out and we ran into these roadblocks. To really get that done, I don't see that this is worth the amount of time that you're going to invest in. And looking at it from a business use case, it's going to hurt your business probably a lot more the fact that we're not really able to get this and you're dumping a lot of money into this hole rather than trying to spin wheels and do that. So those are some of the key takeaways that, if anything else, you remember from our talk today. And I have about two minutes for questions. Yes. Can you give me an example for a boundary statement for the person that's communicating directly with the client? Mm -hmm. Say, like, um, you said, like, the example of the client wants this exploding unicorn, and it doesn't fit, say, their client base. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, a boundary statement, I would say, would highlight a lot more on the financial impact of that to them. Um, so for instance, you would say, actually, here's a really great one. Had a pretty huge project the other day for, I guess, a huge dictionary provider. And one of the keys or the issues was to create a pattern that when they clicked on it, it would kind of keep dropping down. And then when you clicked on the final one, it would kind of slide up. Uh, so in no natural, in the environment that it was in, it was introducing a uh, pattern, like a user experience pattern, that wouldn't be, that would actually get reported as a bug from the user. Um, and the excuse given to me by higher ups was, oh, the client will pay for it. Um, I didn't agree with that because it doesn't matter if the client is paying for it or not. Time and money are very crucial. Um, the user in this case is important because it's a user-driven site versus a client-driven site. So for them, I presented two case points and kind of saying, my boundaries with this lie no. For one, user experience-wise, it's not in the best interest of the user. And we already have a pattern elsewhere in the site that we can use for this particular use case. Um, and instead of introducing a new pattern, we already have one that exists. So that saves time in the end, which helps save them money, which allows you to build better trust. You're being upfront with your client. You're letting them know what the issue is. Um, and then going to you know, your next project, they'll be like, OK, I trust their you know, expertise and their thought process on this particular thing. Um, so that's one thing that could help you with that. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Can you give some examples as to some successful metrics other than what might be so obvious? Yes. Time. Five minutes? All right. So in terms of uh, successful metrics, I would say um, one pretty common one is time to completion. So if I estimated that this project is going to take me four weeks to complete uh, and we were able to wrap everything up in two and a half weeks, then I know I was able to exceed my expectations on whatever my estimates were for that. So yeah. yeah. All right. And thank you all. <laughs>